Welcome to the Last Generation Theology Symposium here at Secrets Unsealed. We're so privileged to be with you today. And we will be discussing as a panel the question today of is last generation theology an add-on of Adventism or is it simply Adventism? And so with me here on the platform are several pastors and theologians. And we would just like to start with a word of prayer and I'd like to invite Pastor Bohr to open us with prayer if that's okay. Father in heaven, as we discuss this very, very important topic, we plead for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Mm. Give us clarity of thought. May we be understood as we speak. And Lord, that this might be not only informational, but transformation. Thank you for the privilege of prayer and for answering. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we have the belief of Adventism uh, in uh, theory, but what, uh, where do we get that? Where, where would we get that theory in the Bible of Adventism? What is Adventism before we even determine whether or not last generation theology is a part of that? Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to start? Revelation 12, 17. <laughs> okay, let's go to Revelation 12, 17. There's plenty of places in Scripture that talk about this. Foolish me, I forgot. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Revelation 12, 17. Dr. Zivadinovich, would you please read 1217? I would be happy to. Revelation 1217. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the remnant of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Mm. Okay, so this text is talking obviously about a controversy between a group of people, and how would we know that this remnant has anything to do with Adventism? <laughs> well, I think that the reason why is because this text underlines two characteristics. One characteristic is that the remnant will keep the commandments of God, all of them, yes. including the fourth. It also says that the remnant will have the testimony of Jesus Christ, mm. identified in Revelation 19, 10, in Revelation 22, 8, and 9, as the spirit of prophecy. Mm. In other words, the remnant will have a prophet who writes in harmony with the Bible, explains, amplifies, mm. and corrects those who go astray from Scripture. Mm. So the two main characteristics of this verse identify the true remnant church, and the message which they're going to proclaim. Mm -hmm. So both of these would be an essential portion, and you cannot do without either one. So very good. Let's, uh, let's take another, another suggestion of a place we could go to see Adventism in the Bible. Revelation 14. Next three chapter. Angel, three angel messages. Revelation 14. And could you read the section that you're referring to? Me? Okay. Well, <clears throat> right before the three angel messages, the three angel messages are the messages, but who, are, who is preaching those messages in, in, in its fullness? We look at Revelation 14, verses 1 to 5. And there is a description of a particular kinds of people. And here it says, Revelation 14, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps, and they sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song, that experience. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no deceit. 
for they are without fault before the throne of God. Amen. Powerful passage. Okay, so we haven't even started discussing what might be referred to by saying last generation theology. We're simply looking at texts that talk about Adventism. Right. So uh, this is, yeah. go ahead. Let's not forget, this, is, this comes out of the Old Testament. Uh, Zephaniah 3, 13. Uh, Ze Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 13. Even though I foolishly forgot my Bible, thankfully I have so a lot of these texts memorized. Uh, Zephaniah 3, 13, and the entire chapter, by the way, is an end time chapter. When you read Zephaniah 3, it's all about the last days. And in verse 13 it says, The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Well, Zechariah is even quoting, and both John and Zechariah are citing Isaiah 53, where it says that Jesus the Lamb, the seat was not found yeah. in his mouth. That was Zephaniah, the, not Zechariah, by Zephaniah, the way. Zephaniah, <laughs> right. So the exact portion of the test is copy paste in 53.10, I, I believe, Isaiah 53.9 says the Lamb, Jesus Christ, it says, and, and there was no deceit in his mouth. And that, that exact sentence is applied to the 144,000. Yes. So what Jesus experienced is what 144,000 are experiencing in their spiritual walk. And let's not forget 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22, that says, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in His steps, who did no sin, neither was guile, found in his mouth. Quoting Isaiah 53. There we are. So, so there, is a, uh, there is a definition of Advent. What is the definition of Advent? The coming of Christ, right? So how are we to connect the first five verses of Revelation 14 okay. to the Advent? What is the connection? Because we've just talked about a group of people that are without fault but how would we connect that to, why would we say that's part of the Advent message? I think one of the, the major things is the, the organization of Revelation chapter 14. Because you have verses 1 to 5, which references the special group you mentioned, or the verses mentioned. Then you have the, the, the delineation of the three angels' messages. And then, in the last portion of Revelation 14, you have the second coming. Right. And so, in other words, it's saying a group is formed as a result of the proclamation of these, this threefold message that prepares a people for the second advent. And so therefore, there's only, and according to the first message, it's a message of judgment. So that means whoever this group is that, that we're looking for, Adventist, mm -hmm. it has to be a group that proclaims the second coming in light of the present judgment transpiring. Mm. That's that in verse 7, sense. right? That's verse 7, yes. For the hour of His judgment has come, the first yeah. angel message, right? Yes. I think Fred had something he wanted to say. Well, he said what I was going to oh, say. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. okay, so we, we do see the advent of Christ in Revelation 14. We see Him coming in verse 14 to harvest, and then we also see the harvest. We see the first fruits of the harvest in this group of people. So we can definitely say this is an Adventist chapter. Yes. Any, other, any other sections of Scripture that are distinct? Yes, go ahead. Well, I, I would like to just add one more thing on Revelation 14. Revelation 13, the 13th chapter, describes the mark of the beast crisis. One of the important messages in Revelation 14 is not to get the mark of the beast. So this 144,000 is introduced, is introduced in the context of the final crisis over the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. So it fits be even before the second coming. Yeah. If I could add something, there's actually three pictures of the 144,000 in Revelation. You can't understand chapter 14 without chapter 7. That's seven. right. That's and right. the background of chapter 7 is Ezekiel 9. Of course. So that's a crucial passage. Ceiling. Because it speaks about a group that sigh and cry because of the abominations that are being committed among God's people mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. Furthermore, it's interesting to notice that in, in uh, Ezekiel, those who sigh and cry, you know, they are the faithful. In Revelation chapter 14, there, uh, chapter 7 rather, it says, 
place the seal on the servants mm. of the God of heaven. Mm. So the servants are the ones that sigh and cry. Mm. So in Revelation 7, you have the sealing of the 144,000. In Revelation 14, you have the character of the 144,000. And then after the second coming in chapter 14, in Revelation 15, 2 through 4, you have the victory of the 144,000 over the beast, his image, and his mark. So you have the sealing, the character, and the victory, yes. the final victory over the beast, his image, and his mark. And especially this is important in chapter 7, which is the only other place the 144,000 is mentioned. And it's worth reading the first verses. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, here's the key, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And then verse 4 describes them as 144,000. So there can be no end to this world's misery, pain, and suffering until this group of people is sealed and ready to do what Revelation 14 describes them as doing. So that becomes crucial as to when Jesus can come. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Okay, what were you going to say? I was going to say, I was going to say that uh, Revelation 14 identifies the second coming as a harvest. Uh, Jesus comes with a sickle. What do you do with a sickle? You harvest grain. And a key feature of last generation theology is that Jesus cannot come until the harvest is ripe. You know, you can't pick tomatoes until they're nice and red. Now, I know some people make green salsa out of the green ones, <laughs> and that's fine. <laughs> in, in southwest Michigan uh, this year, we have had a glut of beautiful ripe tomatoes. And so when you let them ripen, then you pick them. And that's what God is waiting for in the lives of his saints. Amen. So what the we harvest read, principle. I'm sorry, go ahead. The harvest principle. Exactly. Exactly. So, so the harvest, does that come at the beginning or does that, that come at the end? It's obviously the end, right? Well, yeah. So well, the <clears throat> where I come from in Croatia, we actually have a lot of grapes. It's one of the best regions for for grapes in the world, in my region. And so People always say that for grapes, the best is to have an early rain in the early spring, and then you have a long dry summer, so the sugar in the grape makes more sweet. But it's too that. You, but then you want a little bit of rain before the harvest, so it gets nice and plump. Latter rain, and I believe it's a similar in also in some because Mediterranean is close to the Middle East. So I believe it's similar, the early and the latter rain uh, experience that people have of the latter rain sealing of the Holy Spirit, it needs to be ripe, the character needs to be uh, perfected, but the, the, the period of tribulation, which is dry period, also is part of the character perfection of the God's people, just like the fruit. That's true in California also, by right? the way. Okay. <laughs> with the, with the <laughs> ripening of grapes. I grew up here. I remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So why, why would the fact that Jesus is coming soon require of necessity a certain type of message and a certain people to proclaim that message? Well, the gospel has been proclaimed in all ages, but the gospel as contemplated by the first angel's message and also the other two is uh, the proclamation of the gospel in a special sense. Yes. The purpose of the three angel's messages is to ripen the harvest. Not only the harvest of the earth, but the grapes of the earth. And Revelation chapter 18 gives a boost to the three angel's messages. And there you have uh, in Revelation chapter 18, the, uh, the idea of separation of the righteous from the unrighteous. Babylon is full of demons. On the other hand, you have those who are calling the faithful out of Babylon. So the purpose of the loud cry and the latter rain is to prepare a people to proclaim the final message to the world so that the world will decide which side they're going to be on. 
and once everyone has decided definitely what side they're going to be on, probation will close, it will do no good to continue preaching the three angels' message. Now, we are going to revisit all these texts again, but we are just simply trying to ascertain what Adventism is before we see how last generation theology would have anything to do with it. Right. Uh, both Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, especially Revelation 7, talks about the, th that number, the 144,000. It says that they need to be sealed because the Lord is holding the winds. Otherwise, the second coming destruction of the world God is saying, no, 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 stop, wait until I seal my people. And when you seal something, you don't, when you seal an en envelope, you don't, you cannot enter inside until you, uh, unless you break the seal. So there's an experience of settling in the truth of God's people, but also settling that character, because it says in ch chapter 14 that the, the seal is the God's character. So when the God character is on God's people fully, and God can stop to intercede for their sins. There's nothing to intercede for. They're sealed. Nothing enters into their heart anymore. And so he can say, intercession is over. I can stop interceding and get out of, come out of sanctuary to take my people. When Jesus comes out of sanctuary, there's no more intercession for sins. And so that is why this, this is very important for the end time understanding that we are, God is telling us to get ready and prepare for the time of trouble when there is no mediator anymore. And the Spirit of Prophecy elaborates on that very much. Rich, do you mind repeating the question? Yes, yes. Sure. So, why would the advent of Jesus being a reality necessitate a special message and a people to proclaim that message? What does the advent of Jesus practically mean to people, specifically in terms of preparation? I think one of the, the major things in light of the question is the importance of uh, the development of character. And so what Jesus is looking for when he appears in the clouds of glory is a generation, especially at that moment. Of course, we have the plethora of different people um, that have been saved across the centuries, across the millenniums, right? But at the end of time, there is a special character development that is needed that will actually reflect Christ's character to the world. And so, therefore now, I think this, in light of what was mentioned before, this brings, this character revelation, this perfection of character revealed to the world is what actually polarizes it. Because as it, um, I believe it was Desire of Ages that said that Jesus' character was so pure that in the face of that character, even in the days of his growth as a, a child into a teenager, it was seen as repulsive to his brothers, mm -hmm. right? And so therefore now, if we parallel that to the end of time, Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom, which is connected to the three angels' messages, when that now is exemplified in the human life, it will polarize the world, one group reflecting the image of Satan and one group reflecting the image of God. So when Christ comes in the clouds of glory, He looks down and He sees a sea of people that reflect Him perfectly. It's almost like you're, you're looking into a, a lake and you see your, your reflection. And so that's what I see as the connection between the message we're proclaiming and Jesus' second advent. It's the character that it produces. <clears throat> so there must be a preparation to meet Jesus, right? We must prepare, and so we have a message to prepare. And after uh, one more comment, we're gonna, we're gonna look at where in the Bible does it say that Jesus' advent requires preparation. So just be thinking about that. Okay, okay, well I won't quote any of the texts that I was going to quote, uh, but we'll do that in a moment. But um, when we look at Adventism, and all of the counsel God has given to us as a people. You know, God didn't give all that counsel to Martin Luther, who was a beer-drinking anti-Semite. You know, he wouldn't be welcome at any gathering in the church that I know of when you think of uh, his lifestyle and some of his viewpoints. But God still used him. You know, God has used people who have been less than total in their consecration in terms of 
um, in terms of character traits that they didn't know were out of harmony with God. People have died sinning ignorantly. When a Baptist Christian dies keeping Sunday and eating pork, living in harmony with all the light that he's been shown, he's going to be raised in the first resurrection. But that's not good enough for the last generation. The last generation will have to encounter challenges and trials at the deepest level. I'm going to be talking about this at greater length in some of the messages I will deliver. People say that last generation theology says that God has a double standard. That he saves some people who live up only to a certain level of light and then at the last generation they have to live up all the way. Well, first of all, that's biblical. The path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Proverbs 4.18. What about the parable of the sower? You know, among the seeds that fell on good ground, what do we have? Some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. And that's all among the saved. So there's no question that there are different levels of light. The Walden Seas didn't have to be vegetarians. The, you know, a lot of the other people didn't have to live up to all these councils. But those who are going through the final generation, those who like the Navy SEALs, who got Osama bin Laden. I remember reading an article in the Wall Street Journal about their training. It's incredible what they have to go through. And that last week they go through, they call it Hell Week, where they have to swim two miles in the cold ocean and help people along who are, who are with them. And when I read that, I said, you know what that reminds me of? The time of Jacob's trouble. So God is preparing special forces in these last days. And that's where He wants us to be. Pastor Boer, did you have something to share? Some no, text. I was looking up a verse for the next question that you said we're coming, okay, is coming that, up. That's what, I was, that's what I was referring to. Yes. <laughs> now, there's, there's many texts in the Bible that talk about, actually, if you go to Minor Prophets, I was teaching Minor Prophets last semester at Weimar College, and, and I was surprised to see how much Minor Prophets, and we just mentioned Zephaniah before, but Joel uh, yes. and other prophets, they talk about the remnant, the Israel being so corrupt back in the day, but I see in the vision, says a prophet, I see in the vision, Holy people, no blame in their mouth, no guile, and they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. That doesn't mean a little bit or partially following the Lamb wherever He goes. And so, so it is all over the Scripture, actually. It's not just in the book of Revelation. First Thessalonians chapter 5, 23, Paul is saying, uh, May God of peace Himself sanctify you partially. <laughs> he says, Sanctify you wholly, and may your partial spirit, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. For what? for the coming, coming of, the of our Jesus Lord Christ. Jesus Christ. So yeah. connected with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's always this call that there is no partial sanctification at the very end. There's a reason for that. And the book of Revelation gives us that reason. The time of trouble is, is says, as it was never was in the past. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 says that the end time of trouble, as it never was. And so these people must be as it never was. So I'm going to read a text here from 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, it says in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall mm -hmm. melt with fervent heat. Yes. The earth also and the works there therein shall be burned up. Now this is real hell week. Yes. Uh, this, yes. Is, this is really, really uh, the executive judgment. Now notice verse 11 and 14. 11 says, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? And then verse 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you might be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Oh, don't forget verse 12. I didn't. I just, uh, <laughs> yeah. Verse, verses, because that tells us we have to hasten the coming of the yes. Lord in this way. So it, it absolutely, the coming of Christ, Adventism, includes a call to holiness. Now one more text, one more text I'd like to share before we open it up again, and it's in Titus. So Titus chapter 2. This is when I read this, uh, carefully I realized that Paul was an Adventist. Uh, he was an Adventist. 11 to 13. 
uh, verses 11 through 13. Uh, Ellen Elder White Preview, says would you, write, would you that read Jesus that for us? Was the, Ellen White says Jesus was the greatest Adventist ever. That's right. Yes. It's There's in medical statement. ministry. <laughs> she says Jesus was a Seventh-day Adventist. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes, indeed. So we're in Titus chapter 2 and then verses 11 through 13, if Elder Preby would kindly read that for us. Uh, through 14, actually. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, <clears throat> teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might <coughs> redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. All iniquity. Amen. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll just finish it up with verse 15. These things speak and exhort and, re and rebuke, he tells Titus, with all authority, let no man despise thee. Mm. So this is a, a solid Advent passage talking about the importance of preparation. Uh, we've looked at Revelation 12 and 13 and 14 and uh, Revelation chapter 7 as well, Zephaniah. Uh, speaking of a holy people at the end. So uh, there are many texts that talk about the advent of Christ in connection with the preparation or prepared people. So let's now move to the definition of last generation theology. Adventism is not just the fact, the pure fact of Jesus coming. It includes the reason why that is a special message, and that is because it necessitates a preparation for that event. Yes. Can I just add a text Please. to the previous discussion? Please. First John 3. Oh, indeed. Verses 1 to 3. <laughs> You've got to include it that. It directly connects the need to purify with the second coming of Christ. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, that's referring to the second coming, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then verse 3, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Amen. 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 Beautiful. It doesn't say almost like he is. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it says when he appears we will be like him. He's not going to change us to be like him once we're there. So Adventism is the belief that Jesus is coming and also a preparation for that event. So now let's look at what the term, we've all seen text about a last generation in here. Uh, of course there's going to be a last generation. On that even the opponents will agree with us hopefully because it would otherwise necessitate uh, just ignorance of the real facts. There's going to be a last group of people. Uh, but what would you say, let's see if we can arrive at a consensus here, what is a definition of last generation theology that we could all agree on here? Three points. Three points. Although if you read some of my articles online, I have as many as 20 points. Uh, uh, also, Pastor Larry Kirkpatrick, who unfortunately could not join us, he's written a book called Cleanse and Close that has 14 points. But I, I'd like to summarize it as three. Number one, Satan declared that the law of God could not be obeyed. Number two, Jesus came to this earth in fallen human nature to demonstrate that Satan's accusation was false. Number three, God will have an entire generation at the end of time who will live as Jesus lived. And through that demonstration will settle the controversy between good and evil, and vindicate the character of God. Yes, Pastor Bohr. There's something really important, and that is that, you know, Jesus lived a sinless life, but the argument is used that He lived a sinless life because He had a different nature than we do. And so the final generation is going to prove that not only did Jesus overcome sin, in a sinful human nature, but there's going to be a whole generation of saints 
that will live a sinless life in a sinful nature. And in that way, Satan's argument that Christ had the nature of Adam before the fall is totally denounced and totally destroyed. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was a man who never sinned. And, and so he, he proved that you don't have to ever sin and that you can close your life without ever sinning, even as a man. But last generation, the people who will be part of the last generation, the Bible says we have all fallen short, unfortunately, even though we don't have to. We have all fallen short. The Bible doesn't say all have sinned. The Bible doesn't say all must sin. The Bible says all have sinned, reality. But the final generation will be all those who have sinned and fallen into a sinful even character and flesh. But the grace of God has lifted it up even to the level of what Christ has done. So there's, there's two things that God will do. And, and the, 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 the grace that God will impart, it's not through our own effort. It is like I'm going to the dentist and I open my mouth. He does the work. I have cavities, but I have to admit I have cavities. I can't just say, well, I want to live with some cavities. You open your mouth and you let him cleanse you. You let him work upon your heart. And that is last generation theology. You let him. Do not d d resist his work by false theology saying, I can live with some cavity. I can live with some sin, some pain. No, you, we can be cleansed fully. My entire mouth doesn't need to have cavities. Amen. But he doesn't force your mouth open. You have he to open it. He doesn't force my mouth open. <laughs> we have to open the heart. We need to open the heart. I think, um, and going along with what um, uh, Pastor Zivaninovich was mentioning, is that this idea, this, well not idea, this biblical truth is revealed in Scripture. In, Re in Genesis chapter 3 right. and verse 15. Oh, oh. Right? Oh, oh. So, and no one would agree with the text, no one would disagree with the text that I'm showing here that it is speaking about the vindication of God, mm, right? Okay. Verse 15 says, speaking of the coming Messiah, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel. Speaking of the work that Christ would come to do in destroying the works of the enemy. Now that work was a vindicating work. It glorified God. Even mm -hmm. uh, scholars on both sides of the question mm -hmm. would agree that this was a vindicating work. Mm -hmm. However, Romans, Romans, Romans yes. 16. Wow, Romans 16. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so Rome, you guys know where I'm going. So Romans 16 and verse 20, right? Yes. I got so by, by default then, this work is also a vindicating work. And it comes as a result of what uh, Deutschen mentioned, it is as we behold Jesus dying for us, in beholding that brokenness, we are broken to allow God then to work in us, this work that we read in this text. Mm -hmm. It says in verse 20, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of, uh, our, of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. So we have a dual vindicating work. Mm. One, Christ in physical human flesh, and the other, Christ in spiritual flesh, His church, mm. right? Executing this work of glorifying the Father. I think we're all agreed that without Jesus, none of this would be possible. That's right. So, although Jesus did prove that a man can be obedient, we, we acknowledge that his mother was a fallen human being, Mary, thus he was, par he was fully partaker of the human nature, fallen human nature, because Mary was not sinless, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but Christ incarnate without him, the human Jesus could never have conquered. It was a mysterious union. And so it is only, the, the fact is that all of us have a propensity and every single person who will be born has a propensity is going to end up sinning. You don't have to teach a kid to lie, they're going to learn. We all have sinned, but those who are born again after, that means that we through Christ, so everything without Christ, there's no possibility for any of this to happen. That's what I maintain. Amen. 
there's going to be one group of people that will not die. One group of people that will never experience death. There will be. There will be people who will be alive when Jesus comes. They will not see death. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Why are they not dying? Well, same reason Elijah and Enoch didn't die. Enoch and Elijah, that's right. And Jesus he wasn't supposed to die. It was unjust that he died. And so the wages of sin is death. But these people are not dying. Why? Because there is no sin. There is no guile. If they say they are blameless and there is no guile on them. They have come to the point where there is no cavity anymore. God has taken it away. And they, we don't have to be afraid of that. It's a glorious message. People are more afraid of perfection than they are afraid of sin. When I say perfection, whoo, but when you said sin, oh, okay. Sin kills you, not perfection. Anyways. Oh, you just stole yes, my Pastor. thunder for one okay. of my sins. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Bohr. There's a difference between dying and being translated and being translated from among the living. And uh, the prime example that I found of that is Moses. When you look at the last 40 years of the life of Moses, after 40 years in the wilderness, you know, attending uh, Jethro's sheep, and learning humility, learning how to deal with difficult situations, because sheep can be kind of bullheaded, you know. And uh, Ellen White states, and by the way, if you read the whole story of the Exodus, from the time they left till the time they entered Canaan, there is no sin of Moses registered, except when he struck the rock twice. And Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets, that if Moses had not committed that one sin, in failing to give glory to God, he would have been translated to heaven from among the living. That shows that there is a difference between dying and being translated and being translated from among the living. There is. However, we do know that Moses had sinned in Egypt. So, so there was definitely yeah. a sanctification of Moses yes. that was very yes. when he was thorough sheep. from that. So I don't want us to lose hope that we could be a part of that 144,000 because in the past we have sinned, right? That's right. Well, if we're alive when Jesus comes, we better be in that group because yes. 144,000 are That's, living saints. <laughs> That's true. Ellen White describes people who are the closest in that celebration in heaven. And, and so there's 144,000 and she, and she actually mentions some of them were Satanists. She says those who, who were closest to Satan will be closest to God at the oh, end. Oh, yes, that's right. So, so God can change our life in a, in, a, in a great way, the way God has changed Many people's lives. Moses was a murderer. We just, we just spoke, spoke that. And so we don't have to get discouraged if we see our life and we have failed. We know that God can help us and He can lift us up and He can give us victory if we walk with Him like Enoch walked with God and was taken to heaven. There is a crucial concept that I am afraid is almost totally being forgotten in Adventism right now, either by default or by open opposition. And it's called the final atonement. Um, in Leviticus 16, which is the Day of Atonement chapter, as it concludes the whole service in verse uh, 30 uh, of, of Leviticus 16, for on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you. Now there had been atonement sacrifices offered all through the year, but now this is a specific atonement with a specific purpose, which is to cleanse you that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Amen. The purpose of the Day of Atonement, Final Atonement, ministry of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary is to prepare that people that will be clean from all their sins before the Lord. Amen. And I'm afraid that concept has almost disappeared from the radar screen of most Adventists. And sometimes we emphasize so much what Jesus is doing in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, that we forget that we're supposed to be doing what the Israelites did around the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement, mm -hmm. which was gathering, not working, which means that they weren't to be distracted by work. They were supposed to focus about what was going on in the sanctuary, fasting, afflicting their souls. In other words, as Ellen White says, cleansing the temple of the soul yes. in parallel fashion to Christ cleansing uh, the record of sin from the heavenly sanctuary. And we're going to have a sermon on that in the course of this symposium. <laughs> so I think that we're all comfortable with the three points. Is that correct? That, that uh, Pastor Kevin has shared. Is that, is that true? That 
Number I'd one. like to hear the 20. <laughs> Satan's charge. Not now, not now. <laughs> not, not now. Of course, there, there, when the book is published, further uh, further study, of course, will bring out more. Uh, but those are those are just the basic, you know, defining terms that we're working with right now. So as far as last generation theology. Now, as it relates to Adventism, what difference does it make? If it is there or if it is not. Let's talk practically. Was anybody listening to my message, the, the second message I gave this morning, in which I uh, quoted from uh, an article in Spectrum magazine where uh, an author claimed that the big problem in the church is, is, is the desire for purity. That if we only didn't uh, seek purity, we could tolerate more people. Uh, whether the issue is diet or dress or sexuality or their view of origins, uh, he's just really mad about purity. You know, and so what you, what, when, I, when I saw that, I thought, you know, that illustrates beautifully why last generation theology and Adventism are one and the same thing. Because if you believe that it's impossible to overcome sin, then that severs the nerve of the moral imperative regarding any issue there is out there. Whether we're talking about healthful living, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, uh, racism, the mistreatment of the disadvantaged. It doesn't matter what it is. If you believe you can't stop sinning, none of those issues make any difference. Well, you know, mainline denominations have proved one point, and that is when you pitch a big tent, the tent ends up empty. When I was in, um, in Cologne, in France, and we had a um, uh, as expert on growth among different religions. And this guy is atheist, and he is the bi bi biggest expert on church growth. Completely from objective perspective, he's just looking at different data, statistics, and why church grows. And so he came to teach us how to grow our church, even though he's atheist. Okay, that being an issue in itself, we, we, I listened to this presentation, and um, he, he goes in every de denomination, he even goes into those vampire churches that go to Romania and drink blood. He, go, he, he studies every religion. And he was saying the, the biggest religion that grow the most are those who have a standard. Amen. And he said, um, if you want your religion to grow more, have rules. Amen. And he said, that's why he, he mentioned Seventh-day Adventists, and he mentioned Jehovah Witnesses, he mentioned some other who are more conservative religions are growing, and he shows the liberal Christianity in America is dying. They're losing because nobody's standing for nothing. There's no identity you're standing for something. There's no cause that you're standing for, and that there's no meaning. And therefore, it's not important, and people leave. And so, everywhere in the Bible, nowhere do I read in Revelation chapter 14, uh, and this holy generation, 144,000, hate purity or disgusted with purity or I wish we were not pure. I never read this in the Bible. I don't know where do you get this in the Bible. I guess, I guess you don't, yes. There's always a danger of trying to grow the church by using the wrong methods. I've been disturbed by... Um, the recent allegations that last generation theology is an alternate view of Seventh-day Adventist theology. Um, as I sit here, uh, I guess I'm the oldest person on this panel, uh, amazingly so. I'm just, uh, that, that astounds me. But um, I've had the advantage of looking back at my college experience back in the 1960s, when I sat under the, um, the tutelage of a man by the name of W.T. Hyde. Amen. Uh, he's the lesser known brother of Gordon Hyde in the General Conference. But everything that I have been teaching for the last 30 years, I learned then about everything we're talking about right now. That was Adventism. He wrote a book, The Theology of an Adventist, and he included all of this material in that presentation. This is old time Adventism in my history, 
And we don't even have to go back to the 1940s and 30s to, to talk about M. L. Andreasen or the 1890s Wagoner and Jones. In our generation, in our time, this is the essence of Seventh-day Adventism. And I was taught it early, and I just praise God for that. Amen. <clears throat> you know, this is one of the, the most prominent urban legends that has been circulated about last generation theology. The idea that it is primarily the brainchild of three individuals, A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagner, and M.L. Andreasen. Now, not wishing to denigrate or marginalize the contributions of those three men. The fact is, this construct that we're discussing goes all the way back to the earliest pioneers. James White, Joseph Bates, Stephen Haskell, D.T. Bordeaux, W.W. W. Prescott. Um, in Do the late Herbert Douglas's book, Why Jesus Waits, he lists a number of them and quotes from them. But even more so, if you've read the book, A Fork in the Road, that was published more recently, he has a long list of, of, of Adventist notables who were promoters of last generation theology. Um, there have been several leading general conference presidents, W.H. Branson, Robert H. Pearson, and the current incumbent, all of whom believe in last generation theology. And so to, to call it some fringe fanatical idea or to use that despicable word dissidence as one very prominent opponent of last generation theology has done. And this is, a, this is the same man, by the way, who accused the current general, general conference president of being like Adolf Hitler and Joe Stalin and Mao Zedong. And then he has the nerve to call people that believe in last generation theology dissidents. I mean, uh, you know, it's like we so often see in our own time, it's turning the truth on its head. Well, Korah, Dayton, and Abiram, they called Moses a dissident. Uh, they did. Nothing new under the sun, but um, there was a doctoral dissertation by Paul Evans, a doctoral dissertation written in 2005, I believe, at Andrews University that has uh, totally debunked and destroyed this idea that the last generation theology is an add-on to Adventism. He just did a doctoral dissertation objectively. He says, I don't believe in it, but I'm just going to go through it. I'm just going to go through the first pioneer and all of our pioneers and all of our review and heralds and all of our articles, Ellen White. I'm just going to go through it all the way to 1950, I believe. And he says, this is the, just the essence of preparation for the second coming. Yes. So when we say prepare for the coming of the Lord, what does that mean? People are like, oh, prepare watching Super Bowl. No, it's preparing in holiness as we read in Scripture. And so... That whole idea that it's not Adventism is completely, completely not factual. And there's a doctoral dissertation out there. You can go check it out. Paul Evans, doctoral dissertation, Ellen White, and the Last Generation Theology, I believe, or Perfection. I had the privilege of hearing him defend it. Pastor Fred. Yeah, I'm not sure if we ever finished the question about the practical value of believing this. Um, so if we can go back to that, I will. But I, I don't want to, you know, I, I want to continue with what we're on. Um, kind of like to deal with both questions, but I'll, I'll take one. Um, so the whole idea of whether it's an add-on or if it's part of Adventism, uh, the testimony of Jesus, which is a spirit of prophecy, which is an identifying mark of our church, mm -hmm. has a very clear statement on it that everybody knows about. Great Controversy 649, talking about people passing through the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation they have endured the anguish of the time of Jacob's trouble. They have stood without an intercessor through the final outpouring of God's judgments. And she describes her robes washed white in the blood of the Lamb. In their mouth is found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne. I mean, I don't know how clear you can get. I mean, it's in the spirit of prophecy. And whatever you want to label it doesn't matter to me. I, I want to be one of those people. Amen. You know? Amen. And we could talk about what it means to live without an intercessor. It doesn't mean living without Jesus. It doesn't mean living without the help of the Holy Spirit. It just means there's no more need for forgiveness of sin because they're without fault. No, you need sanctifying grace. Yeah, sanctifying A while back, grace. Brother Bohr, you mentioned that a, there's a difference between, uh, uh, standing, between dying in the Lord and standing alive to meet Him. You stole that from James White. 
That's how early that concept has come into Seventh-day Adventism. He believed exactly the same thing. Well, he was a fringe. James White was a fringe. <laughs> I guess he must have been. <laughs> Lunatic fringe. <laughs> Lunatic fringe. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so final, final, one of the final questions that we'll talk about in the, in the remaining few minutes. What does Jesus have to do with last generation theology? <laughs> or maybe it should be phrased, what does Jesus not have to do with it? <laughs> because That's almost <laughs> like asking what do cocoa beans have to do with chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I think it's a matter of like really, if one truly has a relationship with Jesus, this goes back even in our history, when it comes to the aspect of the Millerite movement, the churches that proclaim to love Jesus and to adore Him actually re rejected the message of His soon advent. Mm. And so the question is, do I really want to see the face of Jesus one day without an obstruction, without any obstruction between Him and I? And if that is the case, if I truly love Him, then the call to bring my life into a greater harmony with Him will not be seen as, as we mentioned, it will not be seen as something on the side or, or something that's attacking Adventism. It will actually be seen as a part of it. I was thinking of the, as you guys were talking, it goes back to your, four, your I think the first question you asked, but it's connected with the last. Um, and that is taken from Christ Object Lessons 69, paragraph 1, where it says, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Mm. So it's showing us that the only way that the Lord that we claim to love will come is if we are, uh, if we reflect a character like his own. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it has everything to do with Jesus because his character is the reservoir from, from what, where we're taking everything from. Without him, it, it's impossible. Good, thank you. Yes. I think this whole attack on last, gener last generation theology is based on a misconception concerning the nature of Christ, sure. the human nature of Christ. That's what it's built on. Because if you believe that Jesus had the nature of Adam before the fall, it breaks the link between him and us. But if you believe that Jesus had a sinful human nature, but he never responded to the sinful human nature, never performed any sinful acts or thoughts or spoke any sinful words. In other words, he overcame sin in a sinful human nature. Then it totally disproves Satan's view and it shows that the end time generation through the same resource, the divine power of God can overcome as Christ overcame. Tomorrow I'm gonna to be speaking about uh, the human nature of Christ. Indeed. And the fallen nature of Christ misconception is based totally on a false understanding of what sin is and what constitutes sin in us. And I recommend highly that you stay tuned for the next hour because that's our subject for the next hour. Okay, we're almost done. One last question. Where in the fundamental beliefs of our church would you say this theology exists. Number 12, the remnant and its mission. Read that carefully and it's last generation theology. I think, that, I think there's another one in fundamental belief. I forgot the number, maybe 18 or 19 talks about sanctification. New life in Christ. New Is life that in the Christ. One? It yes. talks about abstaining from activities that do not give glory to God, which is the first angel message. So it must be possible if we're telling people to abstain. Yeah. Or, or else why would we be why telling would, them to so do that? So it is in, incalculated in our fundamentals. Maybe also, we can deal with this in a future session. Yes. Because time is just about up. It's about up. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. And why don't we just have a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you please bless us with your Holy Spirit so we would bear fruit to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.